Welcome to another episode of the Hoops Fix podcast with me, your host Sam Nita, full-time British basketball advocate. And on this week's show, we have Dan Routledge. Dan has been covering the game uh, primarily as a commentator for almost 20 years. Uh, he is one of the foremost experts on the BBL and British basketball in general. And we had a really good hour and 20, hour and 30 minute conversation uh, about British basketball, uh, going into everything from the best game that he's ever called uh, and covered to uh, the state of basketball funding in the UK and why basketball does get a bit of a raw deal. Before we do get into the show, a quick message from ourselves for our Patreon account. We have been getting a bunch of support recently on Patreon and we are still trying to grow that. So if you value our work, if you want to support our work, go check out patreon.com forward slash hoopsfix. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash hoopsfix. And there you can sign up to give as much or as little as you'd like every single month to help us do the work that we do. Obviously, all of this costs money, it costs time, and we are trying to become 100% independent, uh, sust- self-sustaining um, and financially uh, viable. And we can only do that by coming directly to you our audience so anything that you can do to support our work would be hugely appreciated as always uh, i would love to hear your feedback on the show uh, you can email me at any time on sam at hoopsfix.com or you can reach out to me on every single social media platform at hoopsfix um, and as always if you are listening on itunes please do take a quick second to give us a rating and review it would be much appreciated it helps us spread the word and spread the podcast far and wide anyway that is enough from me here is this week's show with me and dan routledge <laughs> Dan, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Obviously, this one has been uh, it's been a long time in the making. I definitely wanted to have you on for for a while, and the sort of the feedback on on social is a lot of people want to want to hear you uh, talk about kind of your career uh, and and how you've come to be uh, where you are. So I guess starting at the beginning, um, you know, how did you get into basketball? Um, I grew up with basketball. Both my parents played. Obviously, my dad's uh, been involved with it was Loughborough when he first came over um, with the what is now the Riders team. He's been involved with that since uh, I think just before I was born, uh, early seventies sort of thing. Um, and we just went to games. Um, my earliest memories of, of childhood was Moat Community College in the gym there, watching my mum play, and my dad was coaching the team and uh, and stuff like that. So. It, I've never not been around basketball. That's the thing. And so your dad, for those that don't know, is, is Kev. Kevin, yes, indeed. Yeah, <laughs> Kevin Routledge. Um, yeah, just what I say that. Just I, I sometimes forget to give people the context of, of kind of uh, who we're talking about. Um, so did you play yourself growing up? I did, yeah. I played for the Leicester Junior team all the way through to under-19s. And at the time, they had an under-23 team that was playing uh, National League. I can't remember what division they were in. And I was uh, got to 19 years of age and I sort of reflected on it and thought, you know what, I'm not actually that good, so I'm going to go get a job instead, instead of trying to just prolong it playing playing National League uh, at under 23 level. And that, that was the, my retirement uh, as such. I, I played local league um, up until about two years ago. And again, with local league, you, you, find, you can f- always find that level below where you can sink down and still look good and feel like you still got it. And I got to the point where there was nowhere else to go and it's time to hang them up really <laughs> fair enough um so yeah so you know we, we've been speaking a little bit over the, la- the course of the last week uh in the run-up to this just to for me to get a bit of prep and a bit of idea you sent me through your kind of basketball cv which is massively extensive um in terms of the things you've done and i guess <laughs> the most interesting thing in amongst that was the the fact that at 15 16 years old you're already a, a sort of pa announcer on, on the mic um i'm assuming that was in leicester yeah it was yeah yeah granby halls in the old days so, so how did how did that come about at such a young age like what, what you know why did you have the confidence and why why did you want to get on the mic i don't think i did i think it was just short straw i, th- I think it was um the the guy who used to do it rob webb uh couldn't do it anymore for whatever reason and my dad turned around to me and said you could do that and I went, really? And I wasn't really that confident at it. It was one of those things where it was sort of like, well, okay. And I think it, whether he thought I would be good at it or it was just he needed somebody to do it and I was the nearest person to him at the first point, I'm not quite sure. Um, but I'll never forget the first game I did. It was a preseason game at Granby Hall. So there was you know, two, 300 people there, uh, some touring college team. And I didn't want to say anything. And it's sort of like ticking down towards game time. And I'm thinking, oh, I've got to say something at some point. And I went to say, hello, ladies and gentlemen. And it came out all wrong. And it was like, oh, no, I'm never going to be able to do this. 
Um, and I think it probably took me about two years to feel comfortable with it. Really? Um, and, and, and that PA gig is, is a tough gig because you've got to get the audience to react to you and you react to them. And uh, I think it's much easier when you're doing the same, same fans every week. You sort of know what pushes their buttons sort of thing. Um, but I think it takes a while to build up. I, it definitely took me a few years. It's like when I see guys like Simon uh, at the O2 or, or, or Birmingham or whatever, and just this random crowd that's just come in for this one game, some of whom may never have been to basketball. Again, the ability to interact with people like that is is quite a challenge. So, so that's I started by by luck or judgment or whatever it was. And uh, and as I say, it took me a couple of years to feel comfortable with it. I think by the end, I, I was pretty pretty decent at it. But it, it's a different skill from, from TV or radio, definitely. For sure. I mean, the fact that you started at such a young age, I guess that's what has then put you in a position now where you've been around the league and the game for so long. You have such a um, sort of broad and extensive experience and you've seen, you've almost seen everything. You kind of know the history. So that was, that was early 90s, right? So what year are we talking? Yeah, that would have been uh, probably 1990. I, was, I would have been 15 in 1989. So it was probably 1990. Wow. Yeah. So you've almost seen the entire evolution of the BBL. Well, I have. I, I wrote a blog a few years ago about um, sort of the history of the game. And it, the National League started in 1972 the pre-runner to the BBL yeah. and I was born in 74 so I feel like we were siblings <laughs> we sort of grew up at the same time yeah uh, we have shared experiences all the way through so yeah I've, I've seen a lot and uh, it's been ups and downs to be fair for the league um, but 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 interesting along the way so the transition um, from being on the mic doing the doing the PA stuff to actually being on the mic uh, for, for the broadcast um, how did that happen what was the first opportunity that kind of presented itself presented itself well, the first one was actually through radio. Again, that was a, a couple of years later. I was probably about 17, 18. And um, it was probably my dad again. BBC Radio Leicester were looking for somebody to do sort of match reports, 30-second reports in the sports bulletin on a, on a Sunday morning after a Saturday night game. Um, and I got put forward for that. And I did that, uh, gosh, probably about 14 years or so. But uh, I'd done it for a year or two before a t any TV opportunities came up and that was a uh, cable channel in leicester cable seven um i still think that was the height of my fame the amount of people that used to come up to me and say i saw you on gary and jim's sports show the other day and it was uh, recognized in the street from gary and jim's sports show was <laughs> was classic uh, but they started covering some some leicester games um and i did the first couple of games i did i actually did as color i was the analyst um i think it was probably rob again doing the 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 lead commentary and then after the first year, they needed somebody to do it permanently because they were coming to, to every game. But I was still doing the PA. Um, so what I, what I did was I did it off tape. So I would come in, uh, I would do the PA of the game on a, on a Saturday night. I would go to college on, on Monday morning. And then Monday afternoon, I'd nip down to the studio and voice over basketball commentary on, on a game uh, that was played two days previously, which it gives you is a different skill again that because you obviously know what's coming, so that's helpful. You, I've got the score sheet with me, so I can I know who's going to score the next basket, sort of thing. But you've got to try and replicate that excitement and and generate that uh, that buzz about the game, doing it in a little room, um, not even as big as this. You know what I mean? With wires everywhere and on a tiny little screen, and and, and try and be excited about it. Um, it, it was interesting, but probably a good way to sort of learn the craft, I think. What goes into a game? Like if you, you know, you've got a game later or let's say you're given a game where maybe you're not as familiar with the league, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of new gig. Um, you know, what is the prep that goes into it? Uh, you know, what are the kind of things that you're thinking about before the game starts? It's much easier these days than it was back when I started because, you know, Google is unbelievable and the amount of information that's out there um, on, on all sorts of players, anywhere you go. So I'll normally, um, so, so tonight I'm doing, I'm doing a game, Euro cup game tonight. And I spent, um, was it Monday night or Sunday evening sitting there preparing. Now it's two teams I've already done this season. So I, I know the players, but you get, I get all the stats together, what the game means, the league standings, the history of the clubs and all of that sort of information. Uh, and my advice when people come and say, well, what do you need to do? I say, Always over-prepare. Always have too much information. You'll probably use 10% of it, but you'll feel a lot better for having the other 90% that you don't need. 
Uh, and I do that. I've got relentless amounts of information on every player, all statistics and, and their profiles and whatever. And then, you know, I might get it out when he's at the free throw line. He's shooting 70% from the line this season. And that'd be the only stat uh, for that entire player in the whole game. But it, it's that sort of belt and braces because the worst thing is to be there in a game where you don't know either team, you don't know anything about it. And it's a real challenge then you've got no security blanket i think um the the hardest gig i ever did uh was uh, about 15 years ago probably 10 10 15 years ago i was doing a game for eurosport and it was the european youth olympic final and it was me and martin henlon yeah and basically it, it, we had no information beforehand we just sort of turned up and normally on their computer system, you get stuff through and there was nothing there, literally nothing. And 10 minutes before we went on air, we got the two team rosters. So all we had was names and shirt numbers. And you've got to bear in mind, this is 15 year old Lithuanians playing against 15 year old Spanish kids. So there's no history on these kids anyway. Um, that's where you need somebody like Martin because Martin is great at, 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 at giving it the big sell and going, this guy's going to be great in, in five, 10 years time. Um, but yeah, that, that's probably the most seat of the pants. I always feel much more comfortable when I've done all my research. It's a little easier uh, now with the BBL because I've been around for so long that actually some of it's already up here. I don't need to have it yeah. in the laptop sort of thing, but, yeah. uh, but I also know it is in the laptop somewhere. And I assume you prefer, you prefer personally doing the, being the play-by-play -play as opposed to doing the color. Yeah, it's 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 interesting the the color. It's, it's again, it's a different technique, different skill. But you have to give some insight more so than because I'm just saying what people are seeing on the screen. It's it's quite uh, straightforward, and and you have to give it the in excitement, enthusiasm, and, and and educate the the viewer in terms of what it means and who's this guy and whatever. But sat next to you, you need somebody who can break it down and and actually turn it into lay speak and tell people something that they didn't see. Um, I, th I think that's a different skill. I like to do it every now and then. It's good fun, but but I do prefer the play-by-play. -play. What do you think are the keys that make somebody good at play-by-play? -play? Um, preparation. I think it helps to, to, to know your craft, but but enjoy it. it it's a game. And, and I say this to people when, uh, when they're doing it for the first time as color. This is me and you sitting down talking about basketball for, for two hours. You do that all the time because you're a coach or a player or whatever whatever their role is. But enjoy it. You, you know, that excitement, that enthusiasm that comes through, that goes out to the people watching at home. Make them feel like this is an important game, this is something exciting and something they want to get behind. I'm going to ask, uh, <coughs> obviously, live basketball at TV has got to deal with the BBL uh, at the moment with the, with the games going out. And I feel like uh, there's a lot of teams that have not spent time recruiting adequately qualified uh, or trained um, commentators. And I do think it, it makes a huge difference in terms of what the viewer experience is. Um, I'm not asking you to throw shade at anyone or anything <laughs> like that. Um, what I would say is, uh, do you feel like you know teams are undervaluing it and sort of not seeing how important it is? I, I mean, I would agree with that. In in defense of uh, of the league, we, we last year were all called up to, to Leicester and given a masterclass by a commentator coach type person from the BBC, um, which even me with 20 years of, of doing it at that level found useful. And, and what he did was he unfortunately he used one of my games as an example and picked out here's something he could have done better and here's something. <laughs> he done. Uh, but as a group and then each of the individual commentary teams went in and he'd broken down their own games and given them some tips and pointers as to where they could could get better. Um, I kind of get the challenge from the club's point of view. It's an extra cost for them if they want to go and get somebody professional in and, and, and do a, a really good job. But, but like you, it's sort of like, I feel like that's the view out to the world. Uh, and the one thing I noticed the change uh, in commentary now is I'm doing commentary and you know something happens, big block, big dunk or something. If I don't hit it, I know, oh man, Sam's going to put that out on his fix <laughs> later and I'm going to sound like an idiot talking about something else where actually that's the view into the league. So even if somebody's not paying money to subscribe to live basketball, they are looking at it on Twitter and they are looking at it on Facebook or Instagram or wherever. And actually you need to 
be conscious of that and and, and actually that is part of the sell out for the sport yeah 100 funny enough i was actually um i was down at performs office yesterday uh doing some stuff in the next window for them uh and they were showing us some examples it's based around uh, sort of clipping highlights and stuff on wsc and they showed us a clip where the commentator had got the name of the player wrong uh that hit the shot and they care about it so much before they distribute it on social they will they got the commentator to go back in re-record it before they actually then released it on social so i do think it is it is so important um to get right and if i was the commentator i would want to go back in and do that because yeah. it reflects badly on me that and it, look it's easy in, in that in, in that thing to get it wrong because if you've not seen this team before i do those euro cup games and it might be it might be February and this is the first time you've seen them all season and doing a commentary and, you know, it's easy to make a mistake here and there. Uh, but that is something now that, you know, 10 years ago, nobody cared about. Yeah. It was one of those things. You just you carry on. And I guess that's the other beauty of, of radio commentary is you never get anything wrong because nobody can see. And that, that, that was the thing. Uh, <laughs> Anthony Rowe was doing the five live commentary at the cup final and he, he rang me up and he was like, what, 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 what advice can you give me? For radio and i said well you're never wrong so don't ever correct yourself because nobody knows that you've got the wrong name there just keep going with it have you ever had any aside from the the olympic the youth olympic one which i think is probably a lot like probably not a lot of people watching it so it didn't really no, matter so much it was a tuesday afternoon on your <laughs> floor i'm guessing we had a fairly low rating um have you had any complete disasters kind of on air in, in on a bigger stage that sort of you look back on you still cringe to this day i can't think of it there, there, there's there's I can't think of it too many. Um, I remember doing a Plymouth game. Um, it was seven or eight years ago, and I, I was doing a thing a few months ago about public speaking and, and talking to people about how you deal with it. And actually, a lot of it is just about confidence and just, you know, even standing up, giving a PowerPoint presentation to a meeting sort of thing. Some people get nervous about that and whatever. And actually, it's what are you nervous about? What's the thing? And actually, it's the voices in your head that cause you the problems and I, I told this story about a game in Plymouth um, I can't remember who it was how long ago but it stuck with me in my head where I said something and as I said it I was like man that was a stupid thing to say I can't believe I don't, I don't even really remember what it was I just remember thinking oh my god and all night it bothered me and actually I probably wasn't as good after that moment because running around my head was going what an idiot that was I watched it back the next day on tape. I didn't even notice it as it went through. And it's one of those things where you go, actually, my performance after that was affected by the demons in my head, which if I just let it go and carry on, nobody else would have noticed. And that, uh, I think that's one of the things of live TV that I've learned is just keep going because people at home don't necessarily notice. I think if you work in TV, you'll notice. So there are times where I'm sitting there at home watching something on telly and go, man something is going off in the truck you because you can just see it in the face or you know that doesn't quite feel right somebody's going nuts in the truck but most people without that experience don't realize yeah. so so just carry on and that's that's kind of the the thing that i took away from that do you spend a lot of time reviewing your own performances like in trying to sort of I guess improve. I I did in the beginning um first uh first when i first started out on sky every sunday morning i would get up and i would watch the game back from the night before and i would go man i said nothing but net six times there. i need to change that and come up with something different and try and uh try and do whatever nowadays i don't tend to do it as much because i i don't i've got kids now uh, <laughs> i don't have as much time to 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 do it but i will watch back particularly the big games uh where it's like i know there's a lot of focus on it and i want to you want to do your best performance. It's like the players. When you're in a final, you want to give the best performance of the season. So I did watch back uh, the cup final from, from the other day. Uh, and I haven't seen all of the women's game back, but I've watched a fair chunk of it. And, and it is about, mm, could have done that a little bit better and, 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 and sort of just reflecting on. And I think if you stop reflecting, then you stop getting, you, you just stick, stick somewhere. It's the same with the, with the nerves. I don't really get nervous about it, but I get excited. And again, that varies depending on what you're, what you're doing. So the cup final, I'm there, I'm pumped, I'm, the adrenaline's going. I'm doing a live basketball, Leicester against whoever. You know, it's not quite the same level and, and, and you can feel that. Um, but again, I think that's part of, of the audience that you're going to. 
Are there any calls that you're particularly proud of that you look back on and you think, I smashed that one? Um, well, I mean, the obvious one uh, was the uh, Manchester Sheffield um, league league final uh, league final game of the league season. They won the league on the final shot, uh, and it was uh, something along the lines of Myers with the head fake, Myers to win it. Yes, which said like that doesn't sound that great, <laughs> but in the context of the game and the excitement of it, uh, and there was a bit of me reflected that that's probably my high water mark. And that was my first season at Sky. So 20 years later, that's still my high water mark. And you sort of go, oh, man, I've never, I've never, I've never reached that again. It's sort of, but that, that's the one game. People always ask me, what was, what was your favorite game? That was the one. And the funny thing about it is everybody remembers the shot and, and the free throws that Dorsey had made at the other end of the floor to tie the game. The beauty of that was the timeouts. It was the pitchers that we had the drama and and the, that that because what happened was um uh, nurse had called a timeout sorry finch had called a timeout chris finch had called a timeout to draw up a play so you've got one minute and obviously a massive crowd in the men and we're just panning round. andy andy finn our director did a super job getting all the great shots and obviously you've got the emotion of fans who know that in the next two seconds the league title is going to be decided one way or the other and uh, you got all of that. And then they came out, they set up to run the play, and Nurse called a timeout because he now wanted to counteract what he, he knew Finch's plays inside out. He wanted to do the, he wanted to call the opposite, change the defense up. So we had two minutes of, of, of crowd shots. Normally I'd say that's terrible, by the way. I got to fill for two minutes. This is a nightmare. But when the pictures look like that, um, it, it was amazing. And you really feel that. So that one, and I had an amazing game uh, in the uh, um, FIBA Asian Championships uh, in the final. It just, it ca again, came down to the last few shots. It was at the end of two weeks, so the voice was a bit croaky, and I never saw it again because it was broadcast all across China, and I never had a copy of it. And then about four years later, there was some TV show on in the background. Again, I think it was on Eurosport or something, and I suddenly heard this croaky voice, and I was like, Oh, that's me. And it was, it was the last player that where it, there was a team shot, miss, tip, tip, trying to tip it in. Um, those are probably the two that stick with me the most. That that game, uh, the first one that you're talking about there, mm. the, the, the title decider is, is one that, you know, people speak about a lot in terms of sort of the BBL's history and, and high moments, I guess. Um, you know, when you when you look at the, the league where it was then and you're looking at it now, you know, what would you say about sort of the, the, the journey that the BBL has been on um, in terms of you covering it and, and what you've seen um, and kind of where it where it's at now? Mm. It's interesting because I'm probably, you, the older you get, you're supposed to go, oh, it's much better in my day. <laughs> it was all much better in my day. And I see a lot of that around people going, oh, you know, in the 90s, it was so much better than now. And, and, and superficially, it was. Uh, but I kind of reflect back on it now and go, that was... A mirage really it was it didn't really exist uh it was just uh, a bunch of rich guys who thought they could make some money out of basketball burning money and then they realized they couldn't do it so they stopped burning money and it all disappeared and if you look at the teams from that era uh the only ones that are that were successful then who are still around now uh is newcastle but but the 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 the, the they weren't really that successful then. They were just spending a lot of money, and that's because of Paul Blake took it on when when um, the sporting club pulled out. And Sheffield, and again, that's that's Yuri and Sarah who carried it on when the rich guy pulled out sort of thing. And actually, the teams that are successful now are the ones that weren't successful then, but they weren't burning money then. They were just trying to survive on scraps. And actually, what they've managed to do is find some level of sustainability so it is that sort of yeah it was great and don't get me wrong i loved going to the men arena and sheffield arena and docklands and all of these places and big crowds and blah 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 but manchester weren't selling any tickets okay they averaged five thousand people turning up every week it was a different five thousand people and they were paying a pound if they were paying anything so that feels fake to me you know what i mean whereas now, okay, th there's nowhere with 5,000 people in, but the people who turn up every week are paying proper money for it, and it, it feels more sustainable. You've obviously got 
Morningside Arena now open. Uh, you've got Newcastle just opening open theirs. There's other places, Bristol in the planning and whatever. And, and to me, the only way it can be successful is through venue usage. And it's one of the things that kind of frustrates me about this country, not necessarily basketball, but this country is how little investment we put into sporting facilities. Uh, and, and that actually most of that investment is sort of private slash charity investment rather than government money. You go into any two two horse town in in France, and they've got, you know, a three thousand seater. It might be a built thirty years ago, but it's still serviceable. That's there for for basketball and and volleyball, or handball, whatever, depending on which country in in Europe you are. And and we just don't do that. And and what we build as sports centres are they're not meant for. They're just meant for recreation, aren't they? It's just a, it's a concrete floor with a million lines on it, most of which are never used. And but they've got some law that says, well, you've got to have all these lines because it's indoor use. And you go, well, what about that field over there that they're playing rugby in? Why don't they play cricket? And there's something can't have that. Well, why do we have to play with badminton lines on? Why can't we have a separate place for the badminton place and a separate place for the basketball place? And and we just don't really get that. And that kind of frustrates me, like. Nothing to do with basketball, just as a person, as a as a citizen, it kind of frustrates me the 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 way we look at sport in this country and and particularly indoor sport um, that we just don't value it enough. And 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 it, it, when I look elsewhere around the world and in countries with less money than we have as, as a country, it it just doesn't sit right. You've obviously written a lot about the funding and stuff uh, over the years and been very involved in in the debate online um when you when you look at sort of uk sports sport england uh what would you like to see them change um if we're talking about what's in the best interest of basketball mm. well to be honest with you uh i, I kind of get the uk sport uh argument and if i was looking at it through their prism um i wouldn't fund certainly the men's team right now i'd probably think the women's team deserve a bit of respect for what they've done um uh, and that coach is amazing by the way and uh they've got a really good crop of players as well uh when they're all there that's a really good team so i think they deserve uh more respect than they've been given um but through the uk sport prism i kind of get it i just don't think that's the right way of looking at things and they are reviewing their model right they, they are yeah they let's are let's talk about what their model is yeah least, just for people that don't know so it's so so basically it's if you can win a medal you'll get some money and and the problem with that is that's a race to the bottom as far as i can see because all you do is you professionalize amateur sport and you amateurize professional sport because it's a complete disincentive to do anything that's hard so basketball, globally popular sport, you could spend all 300 million that they put in and not win a medal. It's going to be hard. Uh, and you can't get lucky with a Mo Farah. You know, Mo Farah, unbelievable athlete. So athletics suddenly is hitting all its medal targets because this guy is amazing and he can win medals on his own. You could get LeBron James to be British. That doesn't mean we'd win we'd have a better chance of it by the way but lebron james and the other guys that we have is not guaranteed to win because the americans have 12 guys who are uh, maybe not lebron james but pretty close to it you know what i mean so so it's very difficult and but the problem with that is then you go well team sport is too hard so let's not bother with that which is basically what they said after london got rid of all team sport except hockey um I have my view on that. Again, hockey's not a globally significant sport. There's nine or ten countries that play it to any sort of level. But if you so if you were going to keep one team sport, that would be that would be the one. But then what you end up doing is you say, well, where can we win? What can we do? And actually, why don't we pick the rich sports that three quarters of the earth can't afford to play? So we go into sailing and stuff that uh, rowing, stuff that's expensive to do because you know. Them African countries aren't going to do it for starters. Most of Asia aren't going to do it. Most of South America is not going to do it. So you're just playing against, you know, other rich white countries. You've got a better chance. There's now only 15. Um, and, and it's that sort of narrowing down. And then what you do is you sort of go, well, 
what does that have to do with the rest of the country? What is the point of investment in sport? Really? Is it about winning medals? Is that the sole thing? Now, I kind of get, I'm old enough to remember Atlanta and, and the, the shamefulness of, of Britain uh, coming back with, with one measly medal. So something needed to be done. I just think they took that something and just kept going with it. And the ultimate destination of that is that you end up doing things that nobody cares about. So we're funding millions of pounds to sports where there's 30,000 people in the whole country do that sport. What's the point of that? You know, yeah, it's great for that one person who wins a medal, but what about the rest of us? What do we get out of that? We get that sort of proxy excitement and enjoyment for two weeks. And then, you know, uh, the the tea tray thing, I forget the name of it, uh, the winter sport where you go down head first on a tea tray. Skeleton. Skeleton. <laughs> tea tray. <laughs> it, 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 we, we win medals at that, right? Great. You can't do it in this country. So if my kid, either of them, six years old and 13 next week, see that and go, Dad, I want to do that. Where do I go? I have to fly to Europe or something to just to try it out. It, 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 I don't see where the benefit of that is. And and I kind of look at it again. I'm, I'm the chair of governance of my local school. I kind of look at it as, well, well, what could we offer our kids out of what we fund? None of it. None of it, basically. We could do athletics, but the rest of it, pretty much none of it. It's not available to our kids. So it's sort of, I just feel like as a, as a, a citizen, we ought to, if we're going to invest that much money, we ought to look at it bigger picture. And that's before you get into the, you know, the health implications in the city, with the, in the country with the obesity levels in children and adults and all of the things coming down the track for people being inactive. I mean, the city I live in, the, the problem for the adult social care is not old people with dementia. It's, it's people my age who lifestyle choices, health choices, being inactive, got diabetes, not managed it, lost a limb, and they've got 30 more years of the council having to help and support them. Whereas if we just encourage them to be a little bit more active, m maybe a slightly better diet, we could save ourselves some money in the longer term. So it, it's a big thing and it kind of people see my name and see I'm sort of going at it, and, oh, he's just moaning because basketball doesn't get funded. And actually, that's one little corner of it. And yeah, it's an important thing because I'd love to see our teams be funded. I'd love to see them do better than they've done. Um, but actually, it's it's that big picture. As a country, what are we funding sport for? What is the purpose of it? And if the purpose is just to, you know, have that sort of gratification, self-gratification two weeks every four years and go, oh, look, we're fourth better, best in the world, third best in the world, whatever. That's Eastern European, you know what I mean? That that that's communist thinking. It's it's that sort of this shows that we're a great nation because what's that? What for? It, it makes no sense. Funny enough, you you retweeted something. I don't know if it was this morning or last night. Uh, where someone has said about you know what is the actual evidence that uh, winning medals actually inspires anyone? Because that is the thing that pretty much it always falls back to it's like well if we win medals what it's going to do is it's going to inspire a nation and then we're going to have way more kids that are more active um but i think actually all the data shows that post 2012 a lot of sports participation stuff has actually gone down it all went down yeah it, it, it all went down and, and, and actually there there is the, the you have to make it available that's the thing so there was a big spike uh post 2012 i think in gymnastics or something but they didn't have enough infrastructure to deal with all of these people coming in. Now, my understanding is they've since put the infrastructure in place, but for that little group of kids, they just missed out. And, and it is that sort of thing. If we're using sport as inspiration, which by the way, I think is a really good thing, because if we invest in elite sport and the only benefit is increased participation by, by grass, at grassroots levels, I'm all for that. I think that would be a tremendous outcome. Um, but like you said, like, like he was saying in the, in the tweet that I, I put out is there's no evidence for it. We're not doing it. And in part, that's because we can't do it. You know, I can't. Uh, dress archery is probably a bad example because there's a lot of people that do uh, horse related sports in this country. It's, it's, it is quite popular, but it's very expensive. So, you know, most of the people in near where I live, 
are not going to be able to afford their own horse to go out and, and do dressage or whatever. Um, the other one, um, uh, modern pentathlon. Where? Where do you do that? In, a, in, an, in, an, in an inner city? It just, you can't do it. So it's sort of like, how can we inspire people if we don't have the facilities for them to go and do what they were inspired to do? And, you know, they're not going to go, I've seen somebody win a dressage gold, so I'm going to go take up running or I'm going to take up cycling or whatever. You have to make it accessible to them. So cycling has done a tremendous job in winning medals over the last 20 years. And we've seen a massive rise in normal people doing cycling, putting their Lycra on on a Sunday and going off around the country road sort of thing. That's good. That's a good outcome. But almost, <clears throat> excuse me, almost no other sports benefit like that. What's the biggest rise in participation in recent years? Park run. Some dude with a stopwatch on a Saturday morning. And suddenly, loads of people like me go out and do it. And it's, that's got nothing to do with what happens from a government level. In fact, it's the very opposite of that. So it's sort of how can we learn from that? And if we're not going to fund the sports we play, what's the point? And what's the biggest problem with basketball participation? Everybody stops at 18. Why is that? They left school. They left school either at 16 or 18. They left school. So now they've got nowhere to go. There's no facilities. There's no organized structure. In football, it's dead easy. If I want to go play five-a-side football, there's a goals down the road from me. There's a, another brand thing. There's loads of those things where I can just turn up and go, I haven't got a team. I just want to play. And they'll go, oh, there's a league over here. You can go on that team every Tuesday night, 7.30 for an hour. There you go. That's there. The equivalent for that isn't there for basketball. Why not? Because we don't have the... It goes back to the point. We don't have the facilities for for just random people to do it. Now, if you build them, Morningside Arena, I go there, my son trains there, and then when his training is finished at, at 9 o'clock, there's a bunch of people stood w waiting to get on court. Just random people who've turned up, paid three quid or whatever it is, to come and run up and down for an hour and a half at, at 9 o'clock at night. That's great. Three years ago, that wouldn't have happened because there was nowhere to go. And that's the problem. That's, you know, basketball's problem is, and all of those people are, it's nine o'clock at night. They're all in their 20s. So this is the market that we've, we have as a sport, have lost. And it's only by having a facility that's not dedicated to basketball, but focused on basketball that we're, we're, we're able to do that. I was gonna, yeah, do you, I mean, I'm assuming you have some sort of inside insight. Um, do you know the tangible difference that the arena has made to the Leicester Riders as a club in terms of the bottom line, the finances, making it more sustainable? Because um, one, one of the things that actually surprised me is that they're not selling out every single game. You know, I, I did think for sure, especially, you know, with someone like Joe Pinch in there, who's, you know, a marketing guru mm -hmm. um, and the outputs are obviously always so clean and stuff. It's like, you know, there's still, I would say the average is definitely not, you know, not close to 2000. Um, so, yeah, like, you, you know, what, from what you know like what difference has it made uh, to the club um and in terms of attendances what do you think needs to be done to be able to make that a regular thing i mean i always think like getting two thousand people a week shouldn't be difficult for our sport but it seems to be consistently well you've fallen into the trap that everybody falls into there and assumed that i have knowledge that i don't necessarily <laughs> have it, it, it's funny before before he uh before he stopped working for real uh, my dad worked in the nuclear industry. Yeah. Nobody ever came up to me and went, what's going on with size well be? You must know. Your dad Your dad does it. Yeah. It, it's that thing. Of people People do assume I know more about Leicester than I, than I actually do. I, I, I do see him, but we don't tend to talk shop. We talk grandkids and stuff uh, like that. But what difference has it made? Well, number one, my son uh, plays for the, for the junior teams. The junior teams have a place to train, and that's huge. And, and the... the the cost of that to any club. When I played uh, junior basketball, we had all the way through age groups. And then at some point, and I can't remember when it was, it all stopped because it was too expensive to run junior basketball. And that, to me, it's really short-sighted to cut that off. But when you've got no money, you've got to, you've got to make savings somewhere. So the fact that every time you go down there, between six and nine o'clock, there will be at least two courts of kids playing sport 
both the the, the actual national league uh, and regional league teams as well as just kids who've turned up and just want to try basketball for the first time so participation wise that's been huge uh in terms of getting people through the door um yeah you're probably right uh they, they, they don't get as many through as you might have hoped I still think it's a tough market. I still think it's tough to get people to turn up. And when I talk to like Paul Blake uh, about it, he he will go on for a long time about schedule and how hard it is to get people through the door and trying to do do it in the in the right way and build it up. Um, it, it isn't easy to sell tickets. It, 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 I think it's one of the common misconceptions in, 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 from people from outside the sport looking in and go, well, if I was running it better, is, is like, well, why do you think they're not doing it? What, what do you think? And uh, what do you think that it, they're not trying or something to do it? They're not Leicester per se, but all clubs. And I saw, again, I go back to the 1990s. The people who were in charge of the clubs then, they were events people. They were music, um, uh, people who put on musical concerts and stuff like that. That's what they did, sell tickets. And what did they do? gave them all away for free so that even they couldn't sell the ticket so I, I think it kind of says it's not an easy market to do now I think part of the problem in this country is we're obsessed with football everybody's obsessed with football um, but if you look at the way uh, media coverage and 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 just airtime is taken up on football it is unbelievable compared to 20 years ago 20 years ago back page of a newspaper back when people used to read newspapers by the way would not be one football story or two football stories it would be a lot of different sports stories uh and then inside there would be other sports stories now it's eight ten pages of sport uh, and it's all football you might get a little bit of rugby here and there you might get a little bit of cricket and again in this country we we, we get quite obsessed with globally quite small sports so the challenge, again, going back to the funding, the challenge is, well, GB is not even in the top 10, not even in the top 10 in the world. Now, you and I know how hard, what it would take to get GB in the top 10. The worst England could be at cricket is ninth or something. Like, that would be the worst they could be. The worst they could be at rugby, nine, ten. The worst they could be at netball, four, something. Ho hockey, eight. So actually, in a lot of these sports, the gap between first and wherever you are at, bo at the bottom is minute. It really takes very little. But we're going to hear all about netball this year because obviously they got their World Cup in, in, in Liverpool and how great that team is. And hats off to them. They've, they've done really well. But from where? You know, if, if, it, if, if all they have to do is move three places in the rankings... And that's if GB basketball moved three places in the rankings, I think rankings are false in basketball. But if they moved three places in the rankings, it would make no difference. We've got to be like top eight in Europe, just in Europe to be any halfway decent. And, and, and I think that's one of the problems that the sport has, because I think if the national team is successful, I think that helps everything. I think that I think that rises the tide for everybody. Do you think national team success is more important than domestic league success? Domestic league success, yes, I do, because the the I think the national team cuts through in a way that that domestic doesn't isn't able to because again, the people who make decisions on on uh, on how things are covered in sport have their own backgrounds. So when you listen to Five live sports bulletin in the morning if it's a guy who, who has a rugby league background and there's quite a few of them in five live sport on the monday morning you'll get the scores from the super league or one or two of them oh and you know hold kingston rovers beat hull fc in the derby or whatever if it's somebody without that background they probably won't put that in and that that's an editorial choice being made by one person as to whether they deem that to be important or not so the chances of that person having a basketball background is almost nil. So it becomes very difficult even to just people to acknowledge that something happened. Now, I was listening to Five Live on the way home from Birmingham the other day, and it did talk about uh, uh, the the cup final. 
it was all about Glasgow losing the 10th in a row rather than London winning, but, but there you go. But how you get into that level of consciousness is quite hard for uh, non-traditional British sports. And you see that in Speedway or ice hockey or whatever, that if you're not football, cricket, rugby, the ones that we all played at public school, uh, then you're going to have difficulty getting into that consciousness. The exception to that is if you do well at national level. Any sport that does well at national level gets recognition. Now, how you turn that recognition and, and awareness into people coming through the door and people either be that either playing or watching is another question. But in terms of visibility for the sport, national team success would be more important than anything else. How much do you think um, the London 2012 Olympics ended up being a wasted opportunity for basketball? Oh, totally. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, it was a massive wasted opportunity. What would you have done differently? What would you have liked to have seen done differently than was done? Um, well, I don't want to speak ill of people who are no longer about. I think, I think the people who have ran GB basketball made uh, uh, repeated mistakes in not engaging with local stakeholders um, and coming in they came in as everybody does they looked at the league and went the league's crap so there's no point in listening to them uh, or doing anything with them rather than saying okay this is the league that we have what can we do to ensure that we get the best for this sport so that on September 1st or whenever the Olympics finish 2012 we've got something to leave behind if every if we all go uh, and they didn't do that. They could have chose to subsidize players playing in the in the BBL. We see that central contracts in other sports. They, they could have chose to do that. They could have engaged more with the league. But the thing I look back on is um, they had obviously had a lot of money, both both in terms of sponsorship and, and through uh, UK sport. And they didn't seemingly use that for the benefit of the sport they used it for the benefit of the team to get through and the team had all the facilities that you would want for a team uh, or certainly appeared to me that you would want for for a team at that level but there was no real thought about well what happens after the olympics where do we go from here how do we ensure sustainability and, and longevity and, and they they didn't engage with the league at all. And who's the only, what's the only organization that, that can sell tickets in this country other than the NBA once a year? It's the BBL. It's the only place that sells tickets. I remember doing a game, uh, a couple of games for, I think it was for Channel 4, GB games. Um, and we've got Pops and we've got Lowell. It, peak, peak of both of them. 2010 there, on it, yeah. Out there. Nobody in the crowd. Nobody in the crowd. And it's like, Wow. How, how can we not sell tickets when we've got peak Lowell and peak Pops? It, it's sort of like this is bonkers. And the reality is because the people in charge don't know how to sell tickets. They think people will buy tickets. And there's a big difference between people buying tickets and having you having to sell tickets. And sure, if it's the NFL, if it's the NBA, people will buy tickets. They will come with their money and say, I want a ticket. If you're not those things, or Premier League football, if you're not those things, you have to go and engage people and say, here's a ticket, buy this ticket, buy this ticket, buy this ticket. And the BBL have learned, it's, the, it's one of the things they've done really well over the years, how to sell tickets. Now, it takes them a year, so the cup final tickets for 2020 are already on sale, and they will slog. There'll be somebody on the phone in BBL office right now phoning up school groups or whoever saying, you want these tickets for next year and they'll be doing the same for the playoff finals and and, and it goes around it's a hard slog to sell 8,000 15,000 5,000 that they do every year um, and so why would you not engage the people who do the thing quite well uh, so I think they missed the chance to engage with sport and I think the only time and to be fair it's not always the same people because there's been quite a turnover in Great Britain uh, basketball the only time they engaged with other stakeholders was when they had nothing and they needed help. They got no money left. What can we do? How are we going to do it? Can you help us out? Can you sell tickets for Puerto Rico at home or whatever it was? That was the point. That was too late, in my view. That was too late. And actually, we missed an opportunity. Would it have transformed the sport beyond all recognition? No. But might we be in a slightly better place than we are now, both in terms of the domestic league and the 
uh, national team without a shadow of a doubt, particularly the national team, particularly the national team. I think the national team has been uh, badly served by, by the people in control. Do you think if we ever had a absolute once in a generation talent that you know was NBA MVP potential, it could change everything for the sport? Hmm, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I, it would certainly gain visibility, but it, it it's it's visibility over there, you know what I mean, rather than anything domestically here. It would depend on how much that person engaged in whatever it was over here. So you see Luol with his Den Camp. That's branding over here and doing something positive over here for basketball in this country. And Luol has not had anywhere near the publicity that somebody of his stature deserves. And it, it, it's actually shameful on the British media how overlooked he has been given what he has achieved. Um, and when you look at some of the people we lord up who haven't achieved anywhere near as much as him, but do it in a sport that we pay more attention to, um, it's kind of, I'm sure he's not bothered either way, but it's kind of frustrating as an observer to see to see that. Um, uh, so again, it, it, I don't know that it would necessarily have a massive impact on the game in this country. It, it would raise some awareness around that one person but whether that could directly impact on, because what we want to see is a better domestic league, uh, one able to compete at a higher level in Europe uh, than Leicester were doing this year and that nobody's done for 10 years before that. And also more kids coming through the door and playing the game and then going on and playing it, you know, social, socially um, afterwards, playing local league. Local league in the 10, 15 years that I played, reduced in terms of the number of players i don't know why it's not it's not really something i looked into but that that's got to be concerning because actually those people have an interest in the sport and what are you doing to keep them interested in the sport in another interview i saw you uh, did a few years ago um you, you were talking about uh, British players going abroad and you said that actually you think it's a good thing for the league here, the, the game here, sorry, and not necessarily a bad thing. And you compared it to football and you think you said, oh, actually, you know, I think that it would be better for football here if we had more British players going to play abroad. Like, what's the rationale and thinking behind that? Because I think that is something very different to the sort of consensus. You know, we, when Justin was on the podcast, he was talking about it being a brain drain. You know, we lose all of our top talent and it, and it causes problems here. Um, and I mean, I definitely feel that on some level. Uh, so yeah, I'd be interested to know why, why you think that. Well, First off, I think uh, uh, being a player is a short lifespan. So go and earn the most money you can earn. Of course. A and right now, that isn't in the BBL. So if you can get yourself to the ACB and earn some good money, you go and do that. Um, secondly, uh, the rules have changed. If we ever get on to what the biggest changes in sport was, the one that, that isn't on court was Bosman. Uh, Pre-Bosman, there were three players, I think, in the year before Bosman playing abroad. Bucknell, uh, must be Amici, and Spencer Dunkley. Now, you must have a hard time tracking all these guys on your website, okay? Because there's guys playing in regional league Germany or lower league Spain, lower league France, and, and whatever. Now, those guys might not be massive BBL impact players. So you can see why BBL doesn't put that budget into it when... For the sort of money they're paying there, they could get MVP level American player. So you, it, it's a it's a difficult one for the club to say. Well, actually, until the club has enough money to pay them the same amount to sit on the end of the bench, they're not going to do that. Um, I think actually more diversity is a good thing. I think people playing in different places is a good thing because you learn different things different styles, different ways of playing. And those who get to the top end will actually, that will help us when we come back into uh, international uh, international level. And I think in football, it's so myopic of, of British players to just sit in the Premier League or go out on loan to the championship or, and, and just see one flavor, one style, whatever. You look everywhere else, it doesn't happen. Germany, there's lots of Germans playing abroad. Spain, there's loads of Spanish players playing abroad. France, most of them play abroad. But in England, we're only now just starting to see it with um, 
uh, Sanchez and the whole uh, whether the Chelsea kid is going to go to Bayern Munich and whatever. We're just starting to see young British players going, you know what? I'm going to go out there and I'm going to try. Now, I get why they stay because Premier League is where all the money is. So why not? What, if you don't even have to work, you know, you just sit there on the end of the bench and never come on and you still get £50,000 a week. Sign me up for that, you know. But I think actually it's a good thing that people have the opportunity to go out and learn the game in a different way and see different styles of basketball, particularly in Europe, where the game is very different. Because we kind of look to America and we kind of have this... Uh, it, when I was growing up, it was the and one generation, whether it's all of that. And we sort of look over to 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 America and, and, and you know, James Harden, and we all learn how to travel like he travels <laughs> uh, and that sort of thing. And and then you look where all the best players in, in Europe are coming from Eastern Europe, where they're learning how to pick and roll at 10. You know what I mean? They're all about, it's about the right angle and making sure. We do, and they spend a lot of time doing all of that. And, and what's the complaint from foreign coaches when British players come over they don't quite have the IQ because they haven't quite learned the way that we learned it that's not to say that their way is better but they're the ones coaching the team so you need to know their way sort of thing um, and and that's the thing could we take better advantage of our extra athleticism and, and, and our sort of uh, up and down style yeah we could but but actually there is something more to be learned from that and I still think as much as I would love to see Dan Clark come and play for uh, Lions or Newcastle or Leicester or whoever, that'd be great. I think actually Dan Clark has benefited from playing at that level. And even if he did come over here and whatever team he played for went Europe Cup, is that a step up? I don't know. I just, I just think we should... I, the challenge is the people who are not at Dan Clark's level, how do we get them playing in the BBL? And how do we have enough money as a league and as clubs to ensure that the guys who are going to play in NM1, why are they not playing here? On account, the, the, the opposite side of that, obviously this year we, we've seen an influx of British talent that you know we haven't seen before with the London City Royals coming in and signing Matthew and Ashley and a bunch of those guys. Um, you know, how, how good do you think it's been for the league to have uh, these English stars this year for the first time? Um, and obviously, I would I would guess probably a stronger British pe- presence in terms of their contributions on the court than ever before. Uh, well, certainly in the post Bosman era, because obviously before Bosman, yeah. none of them could go anywhere, so all the best players were sort of limited. That that's kind of where I get from. I get just inside of it, um, but I kind of look at it from the era of I saw guys for twenty years who were stuck in this country because of now what now look like bizarre eligibility rules that maybe could have gone and earn more money somewhere else um i think it's great i think it's great to have uh, guys like um uh, matthew and ashley in the league and justin last year fantastic mm-hmm. he's one of my favorite players in the league the issue for the royals is i'm assuming they've paid them a going rate um and i'm assuming that going rate for those two players is significantly higher than other players in the league um how they generate enough income to make that work is going to be the challenge for the Royals. Now, I'm, I'm guessing nobody brings a team in with that level of talent and expects to make money in year one, but by year three or year five, they've got to try and find the commercial way of making that work. And that would be the, the worry I would have, if you like, is there's no point in having those guys for one year or two years if it if the club is unsustainable like that, um, it, it's about how do we as a league make it so that those players have the opportunity to play in the in this country in a way that's sustainable to the clubs. And this goes back to how do you get more people through the door? How do you get more sponsorship? How do you get more visibility? And all of the challenges around that. What do you think are the, the biggest things that BBL clubs need to do that maybe they're not doing at the moment? Uh, to help themselves become more financially viable and sustainable and commercially minded, maybe. Wow, if I had the answer to that, I think I'd be selling it. Wouldn't yeah, I? I could sell it to twelve different clubs, couldn't I? <laughs> it, it, I think I, I think it's uh, it comes back to building it locally. I, I, I think the only way is by getting presence locally. 
So if I go back to Leicester, um, they've done a very good job uh, of increasing their visibility within the city and being part of the sporting landscape. So in 1997, I think it was, the football club won the whatever the League Cup was called at the time. The rugby club won something and the cricket club won something and they put a statue in the middle of town with three sports. The basketball team won something a few months later but never got on a statue anywhere. Um, if they, after, the, after Leicester City won the Premier League the other year, if they were going to build a statue, they would have put a basketball thing on there because the visibility of the club was there. Um, helps winning. Winning helps everything. Um, but the visibility within the city is much greater than it was 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and I think that's how you generate people coming through the door and interest from sponsors. And those are the two things that bring you money. So I think Paul does a really good job of that in Newcastle. Again, just looking from afar in, in, in that they seem to have a, a good, solid base of, uh, of fan support and good support within, um, the, within the area. But that's a hard slog. That's a hard slog and it requires some investment because you need to have enough people uh, to go out there and do that in the first place. And I think, you know, it's a catch-22. Is If you don't invest, then how can you realize on that investment? But then you you need to invest to realize on the investment. Even, even uh, non-locally, um, one of the things I wanted to ask you actually was was kind of how you stay on top of the BBR. Because I think for fans, it's very hard because ultimately... If you don't watch it live, you can't really watch it. Mm. Um, so on, you know, on a you know on a typical game night, if you're not commentating and you're just following, um, you know, what, what is your setup? Is it live basketball TV split to four screens? Yeah, yeah basically, that's... basically live basketball to four screens with tweet deck running down the side of it, and 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 my wife and my kids over there on the sofa <laughs> ignoring me, <laughs> calling me a nerd. Um, yeah, so that I mean that's basically it, but. But the sort of flip round from that is, and again, we're slightly different generation, is how did I keep up with it 20 years ago? I put CFAX on and I would wait for CFAX to update the quarter score. And, and then if they didn't do that, it might be the next day that I would find out where the result was. So actually, it's never been easier yeah. to keep on top of it because even if you don't subscribe to live basketball TV, you can sit there on Twitter and most clubs, not all of them, but most clubs do a pretty decent job of sending out in-game uh, information so you know what the score is. Quite a few of them uh, have in-game highlights going out so you can sit there and watch some dunk that just happened a minute ago and it's right there in front of you. So actually, in some ways, it's easier to get to your market now because you have a direct line into them, whereas previously it was always via an intermediary. So you would always have to go to the paper and say, well, you know, we didn't really get that much space this week. What, what, can we have a bit more next week? And the challenge that they that, that, that they would have of fitting you in amongst all the other things that they do. Whereas now through social media and through the internet, you've got a direct line into the audience that you want. The key is how you cultivate and grow that audience. And I think you probably know the answer to that better than I do. I don't know if I do, you know. It's uh, is like you like you said earlier when I was asking you. It's like a million dollar question, you know. I think whenever I speak to journalists from abroad when they contact me, they're not doing a thing about basketball in the UK. I'm, I always just say like, I just don't even know the answer. Like yeah. I can I can say what my best guesses are. We all we're all pretty aware of the issues, but actually, no one's been able to solve it. Um, everyone thinks they can. That's a hundred percent why we get all these people from outside the sport coming yeah. and say. What you've got this many people playing basketball every week. You've got all of this in place, but it's not working. This is a great opportunity. I can come in and I can make millions and millions. And of course, it, it never works it out never like works. that. Um, they, that was actually what you were saying about the game being propped up by by rich owners. Uh, that's super interesting for me because I always think in my head, I'm always like, well, basketball can uh, bring in crowds because of that era. It proved it in many ways. But actually, if none of them are buying the tickets. It's like, well, they're just being given away tickets and they come to the... It's like, you need to see that people are willing to part with their money Here's and a story they value for it. You. Yeah, Here's a story for you. Manchester Giants, who probably... The original Manchester Giants, who probably spent more money than anybody else. Uh, um, 
one of their fans rang up the league office. I used to work at the league office. Rang up to buy a ticket for the playoff final. Late 90s, maybe 2000. Can't remember exactly when it was. How much was the... I want the best seats in the house. Band A seats, courtside seats. How much are they? £25. How much is the child ticket? £25. Band A, all one price, £25. And he went, £25? That's more than I paid for my season ticket. So he's paying £25. So his view of the sport is it's worth £1 a game because he's paid £25 for an entire season. And that was the problem of that era is it totally devalued itself. So what happened when Manchester, when the, when the Cook Group pulled out, having spent all that money and given away all those tickets or sold them for a pound, I think my recollection is they would just go around the Greater Manchester area. So, you know, one week it was Trafford week and next week it was some other Altrincham week or something, you know, and they would, if you lived in that area, you got a one pound ticket deal. So it was different people every week. Uh, and what happened was Manchester pulled, they pulled out and the club tried to struggle on for a little while afterwards, but the people who came in afterwards couldn't sell tickets because everybody went, it's not worth anything. I used to get them for free. Why are you going to try and suddenly charge me 10, 12 pounds for something I used to get for free? I want a free ticket. And that is the that is why most of those legacy clubs don't didn't carry on because there was no way of carrying them on because you've undervalued yourself and actually people just won't pay. What, what? And it's why the Leicesters and the Chesters and what is now London Lions still exist because they never cut price tickets because they couldn't afford to. They just sold the ticket at the ticket price and people paid and they didn't mind that their team was a bit rubbish and down the bottom end of the table. And then when they came in and now that they're further up the table, more of them come in. So we talked about Leicester's crowds. They were getting 700 people uh, at the point. Well, if you go back to the Loughborough days when they were uh, uh, bottom of the league and not winning for a calendar or winning once in a calendar year, they were getting 200 people because there was only 200 idiots who would part with any money to go and watch a team that was out of the game after the end of the first quarter. And that, that that's where winning helps is now they're probably 1,500 people. Well, that's still twice as many as were in John Sanford. This is it's a hard conversation to have because I, I, I like being an optimist about the, about you know I'm like yeah like basketball can work in this country it's got all this potential but do you actually think that it can like do you think that we could ever get to a point where you know clubs are selling three thousand tickets a week to games like do you think that's actually a realistic po- possibility? I think the older I've got, the more skeptical of that I, I've become. That's depressing. But it is depressing. <laughs> but but I I do believe that actually with the venues that's the key because. I go back to the the thing I wrote a few years ago about why venues were so important. Uh, If you look at Rugby Union, uh, Rugby Union, as far as I can tell, has two business models. There's the sort of Leicester Northampton way, which is uh, generate good profit, pay good wages uh, and and uh, and make money. And then I won't name names. There's some other clubs who have elaborate ways of being funded that nobody quite understands and seemingly just it's somebody burning some money somewhere in the background um, and whether that's for tax purposes or not I'm not sure uh, and and actually the the Leicester and New uh, Northampton model is built on what happens in the other six days of the week so uh, the, the, the Tigers uh, ground is a massive conference center every day of the week there's something going on in the various different conference rooms. And they built another stand at the end uh, a couple of years ago. And again, conference facilities were what it's about. And they've got a rubbish old stand on the other side of the thing where people still has a standing terrace and whatever. And they've realized that actually if they regenerate that, it won't make an, as much income difference versus building it. So they're not going to build it because they just can't get any more conference stuff in there basically so the way to be successful in that is to have a building that you can make money out of the other six days of the week and that that is a challenge for basketball now going back to your original question could it be well i look at uh hockey and i don't see ice hockey i don't see much of ice hockey anywhere it's it's similar in sort of basketball in that if i don't make an effort 
You don't know it, about it. it. It doesn't exist. Now, I happen to know it exists. So every now and then I have a little glimpse and they seem to, certainly in Nottingham and Sheffield, seem to get good crowds in and whatever. Um, and man, hockey must be expensive to run. Must yeah. be expensive yeah. to run. All those players, all that equipment. The, the, uh, but they seem to do it in a way that generate that that must be generating money somewhere along the line. So maybe there's something in that that basketball could do. Do I ever see it being, you know, big sport that everybody's talking about and on the back pages and that? Probably not. Um, and uh, is that pessimistic? Possibly. Uh, but I think we have a I think we have a slight cultural bias in this country um, towards the things that we're we invented um so we sort of go we love you know cricket and horse racing and rugby and rugby league and all of this and and we have that sort of bias and also the people who make decisions in this country whether that's by government by editorial whatever tend to have very similar backgrounds if you look at them they tend to be and i'm sweeping generalization i know but they tend to be more middle to to above that uh, in class and a lot of privately educated and went through similar life experiences which is going to school and doing rowing and doing hockey and doing whatever and they never came across basketball and and basketball uh, is viewed as and marketed as to be fair as an urban sport uh, whatever we mean by that whatever that implication is as an urban sport and there is that whole thing where when we were looking at the funding of sport in general i'm not talking about elite level i'm talking about beneath that because the numbers are absolutely shocking in if you go over 20 years of how little investment there has been in grassroots basketball by government agencies compared to any other sport there is that sort of thing you go well i'm not saying it's racist but boy what else could it be you know what i mean there is that sort of thing where you go well why are we not investing in this one group of people when actually this is a group of people that we want to invest in like we want to give people better life chances we want to give people better health opportunities and, and you look at the socioeconomics of the kids playing basketball these are the ones that need the most input and you sort of think well if we're using sport as a vehicle to get into these groups of people uh basketball and boxing are the two sports that do that boxing has the inherent you know risk of do we want to be teaching our kids for all the benefits that boxing gives you're still punching somebody in the face um and and all the you know we're a bit more concussion aware now than we were 20 years ago so why have we never spent that money in, on these groups of people and it's sort of like you you look for reasons and it's quite easy to go it's quite as a basketball person, it's quite easy to go introspective and go, well, we don't do this and we don't do that and we need to do this better and we need to do that better. But actually, hang on a minute, other sports don't do that and we're still investing in them. So why is that? Why does rugby league, which has very low participation numbers, get more money than anybody else per, per person? This was a few years ago data, it might have changed now. Why do they get so much money compared to rugby union or or, or or cricket or and then basketball is off the bottom somewhere why are we not investing in that when when our own numbers say there's a lot of participation there and the socioeconomics of it the demographics of it are apparently the groups that we want to help and support because the other thing that basketball does do that most other sports don't is it gives you life opportunities if you're reasonable at it and there's to me there's something as a citizen something powerful about somebody going to college be that Loughborough or Duke and going and getting an education and never being a professional basketball player you've become a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher which by the way are all things we need in society and are a good thing as a result of the sport that you played that gave you the education and then you compare that to football where they'd really rather you didn't go to school because it gets in the way of your training so if you could just drop out at 13 that'd be great oh by the way we're going to get rid of you at 18 anyway because we've just signed some you know norwegian fullback we don't need you um it, it, 
again, it's one of the few sports where you can the 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 output of it doesn't have to be professional sport. It could be something professional in something else. And there is a structure there. Uh, it, it's in its infancy in this country. But in America, if you want to go out there and if you're able to adjust to the differences out there, you can get yourself a four year degree. And to me, that's almost a better outcome than, you know, having another Justin Robinson. You know, as much as we'd like another Justin Robinson, I'd be equally as happy as if somebody came through and used basketball to become a doctor. The funding thing, uh, in terms of it ticking the boxes and, and not getting the funding that, you know, objectively, I think it's quite easy to make the case that it should. Um, how much would you say that's a failure on leadership to actually fight that cause? Not only not only to fight that cause and, and convey those numbers, uh, but also to not have all the political infighting that makes the sport look like such a joke that, you know, if I was sporting and I would probably think twice about giving, you know, certain bodies money because I like, well, look at the, look at the state of you. I don't actually know that you're going to spend that money very well. I, I completely agree with that. I've got a slight counter argument to it, but I'll come to that. Um, I think I think we have as a sport. It, it's interesting. We talk about the basketball community, and I actually think it's basketball communities. I don't think we are one community, and I'm as guilty as anybody of that. I sort of live in my little BBL world, and I don't really watch the the the, the national league stuff. And I go to the GB games usually because I'm working, by the way. Um, and you know, I don't really engage. I stop playing local league and even when I did play local league those people didn't really go to BBL games anyway and you're probably one of the few guys who gets around to every level and sees everything and, and I suppose my question to you is how many people do you see at multiple levels you know what I mean it's yeah, sort of 100%. like so we're not big enough to to fight against each other if you see what I mean or to have that sort of we need it needs to be our community rather than different communities and we can't have one community going, they're rubbish. I wouldn't deal with them. They're rubbish. Because actually it serves nobody any good because what you end up with is, uh, well, they're a basket we have. case. <laughs> we have. Well, yeah, I, we go back to, to, to um, the summer and, yeah. and the whole GB thing. And to be honest with you, I've... I've had enough of the politics. I was never a big person in politics. Anyway, and pe again, this is another one with the surname is people go, oh, you must be. No, he does all of that. I'm not interested. I like the game. I watch the 40 minutes and anything around that I'm not that interested in. Uh, but even I have got to the point where I just go, I don't care anymore. I just, I don't, I don't know. And that whole thing about uh, GB and the, takeover or was it a takeover and blah 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 and, and the national uh, associations and that it just you just sort of go wow i just don't and if i'm thinking that what the heck is you know the government the ministers the 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 sport england and all of these people think they just they must roll their eyes and go what is going on the counter argument to that is that's not the issue for government. The issue for government is there's a group of people who need funding for something. If the if the people you have to deal with, the agencies you have to deal with are a basket case, find another way. That would be my thing. Find another way. Because if I'm the kid on the street corner in Hackney or Highfields or Toxteth or whatever, you're not funding me because some suit in some association is an idiot how do i gain out of that what what why am i not getting my bit so so my pushback on that is yes i would agree that the governance of the sport has not been spectacularly great i would say that's not really unusual in sport in this country if we look around at at, at, at almost every governing body there are issues and even the ones that get loads and loads of money by the way uh, through through elite sport, we've seen all the issues that um, that cycling has had in recent years, uh, and lots of uh, things about culture in different uh, Olympic sports um, that make um, not sure about that. Um, but it's overlooked because they win a medal, so that's fine. We don't win a medal, so we can't overlook for, for that. Uh, but I, but I still go back to 
If you are the government or you are an agency on behalf of the government spending money to invest in activities for particularly children and young people, that's kind of the thing that I'm more interested in, you have to find a way to ensure that you fulfill your brief. And if the people you deal with are not capable of doing it in a way that satisfies you, find somebody else who will. Which they have done previously when they give, mm. you know, they gave money to Reach and Teach and mm. the Basketball Foundation and kind of moved away from funding um, Basketball Women specifically. So, yeah, no, I think that's a perfectly fair fair mm. counterpoint. Um, well, we're out of time here, so uh, there's, there's, a, there's, well, there's definitely one thing that I wanted to ask about uh, before we do wrap up is is your spreadsheets and your stats. <laughs> um, so, you know, clearly you have a wealth of information. Uh, like, f- what is the back end of that information in terms of how it's how it's recorded and how it's collected? Um, is it just spreadsheets upon spreadsheets that are manually inputted? Like, what, what exactly are you tracking? How are you tracking it all? Why are you tracking it all? Why am I tracking it all? It's probably the most interesting question in the world. Um, because the PBL doesn't pay you to do that. No, 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 no. It's just all off your own back. Yeah, it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. My wife uh, would be rolling her eyes at this point. <laughs> um, no, you know what? I, it, it's it's one of those things that I get quite interested in. I'm a, I'm, it's uh, it's the way my brain's wide. It's it's my place on the spectrum, if you like. Is it's the thing that 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 um, uh, it's how I work. And I became very good at Excel about ten years ago which is helpful so i had i had some of the information before that but until you know how to interrogate it it's a it's a bit of a challenge um so yeah i i sit there updating spreadsheets on my own uh, it's not all manual I'm, I'm 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 pretty good with macros that allow me to pull it in in a, in, a, in a quick and easy way uh, part of it is about being around for a long time as well so that when you see something you go i don't remember that happening before um, and if I don't remember it, that means it might not have happened. So therefore, I can check. But you, you need all the information uh, uh, to check. Um, it, it is one of those things where it's, I, I've n- I'm not got everything complete, and I would like to get everything complete. And I'm working with John Atkinson and with the BBL right now at the minute. I just got some floppy disks last week, and I got super excited about it. <laughs> My wife just called me a nerd six times in a row. <laughs> Um, but it is because I think it's a gap and, and, and you'll know this as well as anybody else is without the history is what are you what are you selling? What do you what have you got? And there is that sort of this is something John Atkinson is really passionate about with the Heritage Center is, is about ensuring that we know what this sport's about, because we do get a lot of churn at the top end. I mean, Andy Webb's been there forever, but but in all the other organizations, you know, if somebody's been there two years, they get a lifetime achievement award, don't they? It's that sort of thing. Um, uh, so we lose a lot of the history, and it's yeah. sort of like I think that's a massive shame. And also, there's something about um, we talk about people not getting the recognition they deserve. Well, actually, if me sending out a tweet that says such and such just did something that nobody's done for 15 years gets that player a little bit of, you know love and respect and whatever then that's a good thing i think it's about their legacy as much as anything else and i enjoy going and watching uh, uh, them play and them perform so if i've got something that that people can give them a bit more respect for because they've done something you know the james jones one the other week he did 900 assists and which is quite a landmark but then when you look at the people who were in the 900s i can't remember the four guys now i think it was dorsey and charles smith and uh, I can't remember the other two, but it was four unbelievable names in the history of uh, British basketball. And it's sort of like, well, actually, just frame him in that. And you sort of it, it, you recognize how you recognize big deal what he's yeah, doing yeah. And, and, and stuff like that. So, it, I mean, it is how my brain works is what I enjoy. And some of it is a little over the top. And sometimes I send something out and go, man, that was only only Philip Brown's going to like that one. <laughs> Nobody else, everybody else is going to go, what are you doing? What are you going on about? Um, but but some of it is about, well, actually, these players are doing stuff and we ought to acknowledge that and acknowledge the achievement that they have and, and, and how uh, what they've done is a good thing. Has the BBO had conversations with you about acquiring that data because surely that's really valuable to them they no they have most of the, they have they i don't think i have anything that they don't have um the difference is that i have 
uh, a way of interrogating it that works for me and I have the knowledge that to be able to pull it to, to, to go hang on a minute that looks a bit odd I've not seen that before I'm going to check it and I'll go and check it and it's 10 o'clock at night and I've just watched four games on a thing and I'll go oh look that will be and I'll just go boom and it's out and I can't sell them that I can't sell them the sort of thoughts in my head and I think that's half of the thing is you can have all the information in the world but if you don't know where to look or if something's significant it, it it's not useful for you I am working with them uh, at the minute as I say to try and fill in the gaps that both of us have and to ensure that what I have matches what they have because the worst thing in the world would be me, me to put something out and go he's done this and they go no he hasn't you know what I mean? Or the other way around. Yeah. Um, but but they have all the, I think, they probably have more information than I do. It's just the way my head works and my ability to turn it into, turn data into in information. Have you ever thought about uh, trying to put it public, like on the website? I have thought about it and I've had people approach me about it and I've sort of gone, well, maybe. And then I've sort of went, I'm not sure there's a market for it. it yeah. It's one of those things that like a few people would, uh, want to access it at very specific points in time and do I want to put all that time and effort into making it useful and accessible and yeah. whatever for for that and you know I spend a lot of time already just because somebody will ask me a question I'll go that's a good one and it then creates something else so that when somebody asks me that question in five years time I'll have that ready yeah. you know what I mean um, but but whether I could spend even more time just doing it as a labor of love, I don't know. I've always said that I would love to see a basketball reference.com yeah. for the British game, like the BBL and also all the GB games. So you could just access all of that data because it is, it does provide the context of the things of like, oh, that's actually like a really big deal or a monumental, monumental occasion or whatever. It, um, it, it will come, it, it, it will be there. The, I was over at uh, Worcester last week and uh, it, they're, they're currently doing a lot of work and Jamie Smith's doing a lot of work on the GB stuff so I think that'll get we'll get there quicker with the GB stuff than we would do, will with the BBL stuff some of the BBL stuff will need to be it's paper based so it will need to be put in a way uh, that is able to be put online in, in some way shape or form but I, I'm a lot more confident now than I would have been three or four years ago that all the gaps that I have will be filled in whether by me or by somebody else, they, it, it will appear. Yeah, I think that, <coughs> that, those, that's the kind of thing that uh, will go a long way in, in uh, sort of helping create a culture around the British game. So I do think so many people just, well, you know, myself included, there's so much stuff that I don't know. You know, anytime I have a conversation with you or any anyone that's been around, obviously a lot longer than me, I'm just like, oh, really? Like, I had no idea. Um, it just does, it does change things uh, so much. A um, couple more shorter questions uh, before we wrap up. Um, your favourite ever BBL player? Oh man! Oh gosh! Um, that's such a difficult question because there's what does favourite ever mean? And it's sort of like, do you go for the best guy or the nicest guy? Or <laughs> um, you know what? I'm going to go back to my youth now, and if I if I can have somebody who straddled BBL and pre BBL, I'm going to say Gene Waldron, because Gene Waldron was the player of my of my uh, teens and 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 into my 20s he was the guy uh that every week i saw play and he was a tremendous scorer i became good friends with him um he's a really really nice guy um and he was a great player some of his greatness was pre-bbl but but he played on into the into the uh, early to mid 90s so i'm gonna say gene but it's probably as much for the memories I have as a child than any numbers I could put out there. The best player to ever play in the BBL? The best player to ever play in the BBL. Again, this is... Uh, it's slightly skewed into what do you count as played in the BBL because you could throw in a guy who came... You know, Dennis Rodman played three games. Does that count? Uh, and he wasn't very good. Uh, but everything else he did in his career was really good. Um, I would be torn between uh, Tony Dorsey uh, because he 
was a phenomenal uh, player in the 90s and Sullivan. Uh, I think Drew Sullivan kind of gets overlooked a bit in when we people people forget that he started on a Euroleague team before he was in the BBL because people forget the level that he played at and sort of view him through a certain prism but he was one of the guys that changed games and he had the ability to change a game by getting a rebound or a steal or you know it, it didn't really show up on the box stat I remember a game uh, uh, when he was at the uh, um, Everton or Mersey whatever it was at the time where they were down two or something three down three and Nate was at the free throw line and I turned to somebody and went, he had to go one for two, so they must be down four. He made the first. I turned to somebody who stood next to me and I went, watch Sullivan bat it to James Jones. Because you could see James Jones was sort of like trying to just sneak around. And Sullivan came in, batted the ball to James Jones in the corner, hits the three, goes to overtime, they win the game. And if they'd lost that game, I think Newcastle were right behind them in the table. If they'd lost that game, they potentially... Uh, lose the league title and it's like where does that show up where does that show up that they won the league title because he went after an offensive rebound on a miss on a deliberately missed free throw and that was the thing i think about sullivan that if you didn't watch him play regularly you didn't always see the way he changed a game and he just went no i'm not having this i'm gonna win cup final cup final against newcastle was another example where Leicester weren't very good and they they didn't look like winning at all and I called the game off. Vince was like, well, you never know and, and Sullivan just went nuts for three minutes and then it ends up, you remember uh, Calvo hitting the three at the end but but it was Sullivan and, and it, his ability to change the game. So if I can split between Dorsey and Sullivan, I'd, I'd go there. If you were to try to sell the BBL to uh, a fan or uh, like a potential fan you want to show them one game which game would it be uh, well I, I, I've already talked about Manchester Sheffield as, as the game that I uh, uh, I enjoyed the most as, as a commentator um, I, I suppose that's probably it but but then can i really pick that game after everything i said about that era era of basketball um same with towers manchester the the trophy final at the nia which came down to the to the final play i don't know i, I don't know that i could narrow down to to one game it's i would i would want to take them along to a game that where it meant something so like we've seen in recent years where Leicester and Newcastle have met late in the season and it was give or take, winner takes all in the league and, and take them to that where you have a home fans rather than in a big arena where you've got a lot of neutral people in and just feel that energy and that passion of two teams that know each other well, going head to head, well coached and, and coming down to the final few plays. Favourite GB moment? Well, I'm hoping my favorite GB moment is still to come, I think, because we've been close, but not quite. Um, funny enough, the one that really sticks in my head was a game I wasn't at, which was uh, Eurobasket against Spain in 2009. And uh, the reason it sticks in my head was I was in uh, uh, Poznan doing... I forget who Israel might have been against somebody or other and somebody had it on the screen down there and we made that tremendous I think we were 12 down or something and came back to take the lead and I was trying to commentate on this meaningless game whilst watching that game and going nuts but not allowed to be going nuts now we ended up losing the game so I don't know that I can pick that as my as my favorite GB moment but as soon as you said that that was the first thing that popped into into my head um I'm going to pick that. Can I pick that? Yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. And then, uh, I guess, finally, looking to the future, you know, what do you see for, for British basketball, for the BBL, for, for, for the domestic game, um, you know, in the, next, in the next year? And then maybe looking ahead to sort of five, ten years, like we've spoken about the... We've been a bit negative about mm -hmm. things. Um, but, you know, 
what do you what do you predict? Where do you think the game will be in the next five ten years? I actually think we're in a decent spot. I think we're in we're in a place where it is it is growing and developing in a way that it wasn't say ten years ago. Um, and I've already spoke a lot about the, the 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 era that it looked at its best, but it really wasn't much of anything. I think now the key is to continue the building of places. So Bristol. If Sheffield can get that going, whatever Manchester are, are going to do, that sort of thing. Because I think that is the thing that gives clubs sustainability and longevity and an ability to generate some income that doesn't rely on solely on Saturday night or Friday night or Sunday afternoon. Um, I, I would like to see a team in Europe next year whether that's Leicester, whether that's London, whether that's Newcastle, now they've got their venue. I would like to see, uh, it might not happen next year, but in the next two years, multiple teams in Europe. My understanding is we have two slots in the BCL. Um, I would like to see teams doing that and doing that regularly because I think Leicester were not a million miles away. Uh, and you look at the teams that they played, by the way, very good teams, Bakken and Cesare are both still doing doing good uh, in that in that competition and they probably should have won a game and they were a bit unlucky in a couple of them where it didn't you know another and another, the injuries of yeah, course and the injuries were terrible um but i would like to see that being a regular thing with teams uh, competing i people say oh what we need is a euroleague team i, I don't buy that because all you're going to do is drop a euroleague team in that's going to be too good for the bbl so they'll either only play in euroleague which will confuse the audience domestically, or they'll play a totally different team in the domestic league, which is kind of what's the point of that. I would, I think it would be better for the league as a whole and the sport as a whole if we organically grew up so that actually we got teams in FIBA Europe Cup, we developed into uh, um, Champions League, and by doing that, the rest of the league came up because you do see in European leagues where the team that's in Europe is you know, 18 and two, 19 and one in the domestic league. And then they win their playoffs in a three game sweep and then they go straight back in and there's such a gulf between the league. And I I don't think that helps, you know what I mean? When Kingston were at the top of the game in the, in the late eighties, early nineties and playing in the highest level in Europe, winning the league 23 and one and the one being because you came home at three in the morning and played that night, you know, that doesn't help anybody else, you know, and I think the one thing that we've seen this year, and London might go on and do the sweep, so this might not be the case, but it seems to be a lot closer between, you know, Worcester's the most talented one and 18 team, whatever they are I've ever seen, by the way. Um, you've got a lot of teams capable of beating each other and you've got that parity and it, I'd be more than happy with four different teams winning four different trophies because what that does is, A, it, in, in, it generates income in four different places where there are four different people have won uh, I think dominance is pretty boring as a, as a spectator um, but also what it does is it keeps the league close and I think whilst we all want it to grow what what I wouldn't want to see is two teams just bump they're off and they basically the league title comes down to who wins the, like you get in Greece or somewhere you get Panathinaikos, Olympiakos and basically whoever wins out of those two is the champion the other one's a runner-up and it's okay that that's probably a slight exaggeration but but you know you get the you get the point i think it's much better if you've got like you have in spain where actually it's quite competitive and yes you do get two or three teams who are usually near the top but you know that doesn't mean the team in ninth place can't beat them that's a perfect place to finish. Uh, Dan, thank you so much for making the trek to East London today. It's much appreciated. Absolute pleasure. Um, uh, I'm sure we'll speak again soon. Will do.